can tell you about the new monitoring program for invasive species or non-indigenous species that we are going to run in Denmark. Okay, that's a great story. So that's my title there in a minute. And I deliberately chose a relatively boring title because I don't have any resource to show you. I'm going to talk to you about how we started out with the planning the uh, program and what it's about and what we're going to do. And if my phone calls, I will take it because today the divers will be out on the first Sunday. And if they find something interesting, they promise to call me. <laughs> so, but also a little bit I know that, uh, that in our conversations, John ended up, well, basically threatening me to be dragged off to St. Kilda and be forced to stand knee high in the water while the sea life lies uh, with a freeze on my, my lower body part. So, So we're going to talk a little bit about where are we now and what is actually driving this process in Denmark. Um, what are the hotspots that we think we are going to look at? And I'm going to talk about the actual program, uh, which is called MONIS 4. It's not the fourth program, but it's the fourth of its kind. Um, but it's the first one that deals with uh, invasive species, and it's also the first one that will do eDNA sampling. So we will do a comparison between conventional and eDNA sampling. Should I stand closer to the mic now? Is that better? Yes. Good. A little bit about uh, Lighthouse. We do uh, a lot of things that has to do with shipping and environment. And I'm not going to talk about ship recycling, but it has great pictures. Um, more about uh, the invasive species stuff. You can read that later. Denmark is a small country. Quite small, actually. You cannot be more than 50 kilometers away from the sea anywhere in Denmark. So we will have 100% of our population uh, within 50 kilometers of the sea. Um, we're on top of Germany, close to Sweden. We have the North Sea to the, to the left and the Baltic uh, to, the, to the right. The Baltic Sea is, uh, well, basically a, a large estuary. Uh, taking the rivers from, uh, from Eastern Europe. And, um, and we have Russia, Finland, a large part of Sweden, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. And they are all, all the vessels that are uh, calling these countries have to pass through the Danish Straits, which are here, these three red uh, straits there. And the red is because there's a lot of traffic. We have 60,000 vessels per year through the Danish Straits, and we have about 30,000 um, uh, calls to ports in Denmark. So it's a lot of shipping in a small country. We also have a lot of shipping uh, companies. Uh, the Maersk is probably the, the best known, world's largest container uh, company. But there is, there's a lot of shipping in Denmark. There's 100,000 people working in shipping. It brings in a lot of money. So shipping is important, and Denmark also always took up a, a, a great responsibility also in the IMO. Um, for a long time, the first general secretary was a Dane. So there was one driver there, sort of an economic driver. We also have a driver for our monitoring program that is due to our membership of the European Union. The European Union on, uh, on this, these issues have two main directives. It's the Water Framework Directive, governing the, uh, the freshwater environment, and it's the Marine Strategy Framework Directive that governs everything with the marine. And they have a number of descriptors, they're called, <clears throat> which are objectives that you need to meet. And one of these descriptors is you need to show good environmental status regarding invasive species or non-indigenous species. That would obviously be not having any. Um, if you have some, you need to monitoring. You need to do some monitoring, and Denmark has no monitoring of non-indigenous species. But 
you have to develop a program by 2015 and you have to operationalize it by 2016. So why don't we have any resource? Because we are late. <laughs> like everyone else. Um, but we're, we're getting there. We're running the first, the first uh, sequence this year. So we are operational in 2017, which is pretty close. By 2020, we need to report back to, uh, to the union on how have we dealt with the results that we have generated and how have we achieved good environmental status. So there's a powerful driver for you. Um, obviously, the Ballast Water Management Convention is pushing us a little bit because when you, if you want to have exemptions, uh, you need to show that you have the same kind of invasive species in both ports that you, that you, that you meet. Uh, that you call, and, and therefore you need surveys. This also goes for our membership of the OSPAR and HELCOM uh, environmental conventions governing the North Sea and, uh, and the Baltic. Uh, there's also the similar requirements. So there's a driver there too. And anyway, we promised to populate the database um, of NIS in OSPAR HELCOM with a joint harmonized procedure. And that's basically the way that OSPAR HELCOM had decided how should we perform the surveys? By and large, it's built on the CRIMP procedure, which you know very well. So, um, except that you don't have to do diving uh, in the joint harmonized procedure. You're allowed to, but you, know, you don't have to. So we started out in 2014, late 2014, and was working with these guys here. NIVA is uh, the Norwegian Institute of Vanforsning Water Research. They have a Danish affiliation uh, and they're much into monitoring issues and so on. There's Lighthouse for you and there's the uh, sampling arm of NEVA. And we came up with this, <coughs> excuse me, this report which basically says how can we use our existing monitoring programs for everything we monitor in the, in, in the environment. Uh, fertilizing and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the state of the environment in general in combination with this new requirement for non-indigenous species. And I won't show you all this, but there's a load of, uh, of monitoring stations everywhere. And we took everything and put it in the bag and shook it and out came our proposal. You, you're not supposed to read it. You're just going to be impressed that there are these many sampling sites. Um, Something that is not part of that program is, is, uh, is any hotspots. It's basically an, uh, uh, a more coastal zone um, program, and it's an open sea program. But we added uh, hotspots here. These are all ports, um, and why, and, and where. So that was part of our proposal to add to these 44 existing stations. 13 hotspots, and we said to the Ministry of Environment, you could take six of the top 10 ferry ports, you could take four of the top 10 cargo ports. If you go top 10 cargo ports in Denmark, you'll pretty much have all of them. Um, you can have three cooling water outlets, and we really think you should consider including uh, six ports with shipyards and, and recycling activities. Denmark is a, in the, it's a little bit peculiar country in that respect because not many European nations have ship recycling. It's something we do in Pakistan and Bangladesh and India and China and so on. Um, but in Denmark, actually, there are five uh, ship recycling uh, facilities, and they recycle um, obsolete fishing vessels, typically trawlers that uh, goes out of, uh, of our production because the quota system shifts and you are, you are actually promoting uh, a new fleet, so the old fleet gets obsolete, and it's recycled in Denmark. Most of the European uh, fishing vessel fleet, when it's obsolete, is, re is recycled there. And we're thinking, well, if you drag in uh, old fishing vessels from almost everywhere in Europe, and you leave them there for a while until you are ready to recycle them, it's probably a hot spot. So in the end, it could be 57, it could be a little bit more, and you should combine that with 48 <clears throat> locations where we would take eDNA samples. 
That went back to the Ministry of Environment, sorry, and they munched a little bit on that and said, oh, by the way, we don't know much about hull fouling or the species that comes with hull fouling. Could you please take a look at that also? So we did that. And to go quick, I will go quickly through that. This is the paper there uh, from Lighthouse. And it's basically asked the same station, the same, same question. Do we have any hotspots and where's our information? There was also a bit on best practice on in-water cleaning. I'm not going to go into that. We asked around, we have, a, we have these 46 species. It looks as if it was one every four year for a long time. And then after 1980, it went a lot quicker. Regarding hull fouling, there's quite a few uh, that could be potential uh, hull fouling species. And this is from uh, Peter Stair's presentation. At the time in 2011 and 12, there were pretty, he was the only one who were really interested in it. And this is from his poster. Um, so we, were, we went back to Peter and tried to redo the, the maths there and, and look at it again and took some of the species that he had in unknown and put it into the ship hull section uh, if they fitted there. And in the end, it's almost the same uh, vector in ballast water and ship hulls. These are not oysters, but, but invasive species that comes with oysters. Um, so there is a little bit of information already but this is haphazardly uh, developed information. It's when you go out and, and make your taxonomic studies for, uh, for the environmental status of um, some you will also count an invasive species if you find it, but you don't actually look for invasive species. And you don't go to places where you would find many invasive species uh, as an objective. You got some databases, um, you have information on, on shipping and we, we use that to find uh, a couple of new uh, hotspots. This is uh, the Port of Refuge uh, places in Denmark. Uh, the red triangles are for the uh, hazardous materials or the tankers, basically. Uh, ships can go and seek uh, refuge here uh, when, the, when, the, uh, when the sea is rough. There are a couple of uh, places where there's a lot of ship to ship transfer here. Uh, the Baltic Sea is relatively shallow and there's a very large uh, oil uh, terminal in Primyosk in Russia. Uh, and they will have smaller shuttle tankers, tankers going out to feed larger tankers um, with the cargo. And they will typically be here or down here. I actually have a summer house here and I can watch them from my summer house. They're there for a long time sometimes, two, three, four weeks. Um, so we added those to, uh, to, to the hotspot scene and, sorry, and sent that all back to the Ministry of Environment and they munched on that also and then they came back with a tender for uh, an open tender for a new monitoring uh, program. And for that, they said, we are going to do a first generation, kind of a pilot. We want you to do a study in 2017 and 2018. So this is not the forever uh, monitoring system. We want you to cover 16 ports, so no off offshore stations. Nothing that would require a boat, basically which, by the way, will uh, with annoy our friends on the little island of Bonholm, which is over here, mm -hmm. because it will require a boat. So they are not in the first part here, but they will be in the second, I'm pretty sure. And we want you to compare conventional sampling with eDNA. They already had a parallel study going on, developing uh, the primers for 21 uh, non-indigenous species, so you would be able to uh, to use that for your your sampling and your analysis. Fortunately, we put up we put up together a, a consortium. This is all uh, pr being privatized these days in Denmark, uh, uh, sampling and monitoring. So we put together a consortium of these NEVA guys and this AMFI consult. These guys are good on, uh, on the eDNA. They, they used to work on, on, uh, on amphibians, which is why they're called AMFI consult. 
The Danish Technical University, Aqua, they are experts on, uh, on fish, and they have used some of these uh, uh, techniques before. The uh, Natural Museum, the Natural History Museum of uh, Denmark is in Copenhagen University, and they have been working a lot with eDNA, and I mean a lot for like 20 years. And then there's me. So this is the program that we came up with uh, to match what was required, and we won the project. Uh, so we are going ahead now, and now it includes. Well, photoplankton, zooplankton, so you can read this yourselves. Um, the important thing here is that we will have uh, sampling of, of fish and, and all of these uh, uh, organisms in two different ways. We will have a uh, part of the system will go for all 16. All 16 ports will be monitored by uh, water samples for the eDNA. And you will have nine dives of transfects, transfects, and that will basically give you fish, but also uh, jellyfish and, uh, and epifauna. In two main ports, it's Esbjerg and Aarhus, you will, we will do two, you know, four <coughs> sessions with full comparison of the eDNA and the conventional methods. And we will come back to all these conventional methods in a minute. First sampling, our summer, uh, now, in 2017, it's actually today. So, conventional sampling, there will be a few pictures here of conventional sampling, and I will go to the eDNA soon. This is pretty straightforward. You sample water, you, you, you filter out the plankton with your plankton net, you do some night dives, and you do your, your, your uh, fish and, uh, and uh, epifauna with the drill net and the fight net. These will be quite large, up to 55 meters, and they will just set out and, and stay there for uh, 40 days, I think. The first, it says here, in each of these uh, uh, harbors, um, we will have two monitoring in June and September. Next, hard substrate. In the two main ports, <clears throat> we will have nine units of, uh, of, uh, of plates, and there will be scrapings from 18 locations in each of the ports. And th those will be, um, there, will no, there will not be a quantitative uh, de determination of, of, of these, but a, a qualitative. We will do grab sampling for all the, uh, for infauna and for uh, epifauna. And for all of these things, we will have a comparison with the eDNA. So the eDNA, well, I'm, this is where I'm, it's getting a little bit tough for me because I didn't like molecular biology at all. Um, so this is the last slide where I'm on safe ground, basically. The next ones will be me taking you through the 101 um, of, uh, of, of eDNA. And if I'm lucky and it's thin, and I don't go through uh, the ice, I will look like Bambi. But anyway, here we have the sampler. This is Amphiconsult's uh, own developed sampler. Uh, you fill up, you take your sample of water and you fill up this bag. You enter it into the sampler and connect this, the things and you have this uh, filter, and you will basically pressurize uh, the, the container here, the canister, and you will get your, your sample onto your filter. And this filter will be plugged, and it will put, be put on ice. There will be two for each, uh, there will be which gets, uh, replicate samples will be taken. Uh, there's a nice three minute long uh, video on how you actually operate this thing if you're interested. <coughs> eDNA. For those who are not familiar with eDNA, such as myself, uh, this is uh, instructive. You can actually sample DNA from, uh, from the environment. That's the E in the eDNA. You can sample it from glaciers and find mammoths. You can sample it from all other uh, matrices here. 
and also from the sea. And you can put it in a fantastic uh, equipment and do your PCR or QPCR and you will end up with a string of, of letters and in the end you can compare that with your existing string of letters for, for organisms that you already know and then if you have a match you found one. Hmm. Very simple. <laughs> so, enough of that. Uh, we will go to the next slide and this is from, this, from, from the guys at the, Co at the Copenhagen University uh, trying to demonstrate here the, the, the work that they have done to, to make sure that we are actually, that the eDNA is representative of the uh, organisms that are out there. First, they did a study, it's here in Elsinore, at 15 uh, primers for 15, uh, no sorry, this was actually a meter bar coding. So, but anyway, they went out there with a lot of, of students and they did this different kind of sampling exercises. And they compared the number of, uh, of organisms that they found with the number of organisms that they detected with eDNA. And as you show, if you angle, you don't get an awful lot of uh, different uh, species. If you do uh, these spike nets and chill nets, a little bit more. If you do day snorkeling, it's, it's kind of, we're closer, getting closer there. But if you do night snorkeling, you'll find I think it's 13 or something, and we'll have a little bit more with the eDNA. So, from that point of perspective, perspective, night snorkeling is is the best way of, uh, of of getting as many organisms as possible. We are talking about fish, these 15 fish, and eDNA will find all of them. So, good eDNA is as good as the best way we uh, we, we currently uh, sample uh, fish. And this is a comparison of the, of the number of fish that you will find, uh, again, with snorkeling. It's a bigger study. All of these are found in both methods. In snorkeling, you find a few species that are not detected by the eDNA. Likewise, with the eDNA, you will find a number of species that you do not find with the other methods. It's always like that. It's just a matter of where do we want to be. And I think we can safely say that we are, we're, we're good here. They had a big study in West Greenland with trawling also, um, and with eDNA, they they found a few species also that were not <coughs> found in the uh, with the trawls, but also with the trawls they did find a few species that are not found in the eDNA. That's the, that's life. The majority, however, is is uh, is uh, shared between uh, both methodologies. So, is this eDNA something that's been around for a long time? We saw this mammoth, right? So if we go out and take a sample in our, in our port, we're going to find every single creature that's been there for a millennium. Well, the port hasn't been there for a millennium. But anyway, will we find a lot of creatures that are, have been there for a year ago? Actually, the, uh, in an environment such as uh, salt water, natural salt water, the DNA disappears relatively quickly. Uh, this, this uh, two fish from the from uh, Harbor, I think it's uh, this is the detection, lim the detection limit, and in about 0.9 days, uh, the eDNA is less than the detection limit, and for the place here, it was 5.9 days. Uh, so it's relatively recent. It's not something that was the last year that we find now. It's relatively recent. Uh, this is from a study in uh, Al Shaheen in, uh, in uh, Egypt, I think, um, on the whale shark. I have forgotten what these two different uh, symbols signify, but the message is it goes away relatively quickly. The half life of, uh, of the DNA in the water is about less than, less than a day. So if it was there, it's because it was there. If we find DNA, it's because it uh, an organism was there recently. Okay, can we quantify? Well, <laughs> yes, we can. Does it uh, does it match the uh, the the abundancy? <coughs> well, sort of, on a broader scale, yes. Um, 
This next one is a little bit difficult, but this one has abundancy and uh, biomass and, uh, and eDNA. And the blue is eDNA and the green is biomass. And eDNA corresponds better with biomass than abundancy, which is probably not very surprising. Um, but in general, there is a good correspondence. The those that have many, also, we also find uh, a lot of eDNA. So now back to uh, the, uh, the study or the, the new program. We were provided with this list of, uh, of organisms and we will do qPCR on 20 of these in 16 ports. Um, we will end up with uh, roughly 2,000 uh, results. It will be triplicates. So we'll, uh, <coughs> and we will cover uh, fish, crustaceans, uh, bivalves, hydroids, and algae and phytoplankton. Um, and now for the summary, but hang around. I've got a bit of royalty for you also in my cliffhanger here. 16 spot, hotspots now, night divers, Two ports will be comprehensively sampled, so we will be able to transfer, we hope, this, uh, the, the results. And, obviously, the authorities have an idea that they can use the eDNA to do, expand the, uh, the program because it's much cheaper to do eDNA than do taxon ta taxonomy. So, and here we got the royalty. And this is actually for a science fair here in Copenhagen, and this is Peter here, and he has this uh, amphibian uh, water thing there, and he manages to persuade the crown princess, who's actually Australian. Um, oh, you recognize her? Yeah. Amazing. Um, to put on a glove and take a sample. There you go. It's for everybody. <laughs> These are the guys uh, involved, and, uh, and, and if you really want to talk about eDNA, call Steen or call Peter Rask. These are the guys. I will, I will put you on to them if you have any questions that is about eDNA. Thank you very much.